after the Second World War, in 1947, it was thought a good idea to add Asian humanities to understand the East. And in this case, the, the Far East, it was originally called Oriental Humanities, but later changed its name to Asian Humanities. And finally, this kind of keep uh, this global um, idea of en enriching the, the students. In 1990, a new requirement was added called major cultures, so that students would have to study two semesters of a, a major culture outside of, let's say, the West or Europe or, or North America. And then by night, by 2008, so two, by 2008, the name of the course was, or the name of the requirement was changed to the global core requirement. So that's what it, where we are at now. So there's kind of a movement out from a narrow center to an understanding of uh, the need to study texts from all over the world. And also from uh, the point of view of non-experts. So in all of these courses, from the literature humanities to the global core, it's not assumed that the professor, the instructor is an expert in everything. In fact, since it's impossible, quite the opposite is assumed. That we approach, there is kind of faculty stretch, and so we approach the text along with the students who are reading them for the first time with humility and with interest and with, with openness. So there was a workshop from 2001 to 2007 called Transcultural um, Sequence of the core curriculum. And it was a workshop with faculty from many different departments involved in teaching in the core curriculum who together collectively came up with a course called Nobility and Civility, a two semester course. So it goes for the full year. And there was input from faculty members from many different departments. And the course is team taught. At one point, there were four professors in the, in the classroom. Now there's uh, an average of two professors. I've taught the course uh, every fall with a colleague um, for over a decade. And from the time when I began teaching this course, um, Shana May was always included. Not, of course, the entire Shana May, but the legend of Seyavash, which was available in a translation by Dick Davis. And we originally used the verse translation, which was handy in a paperback. But lately we've moved to the prose version that is in the kind of the full uh, or, or the, the larger adept, the larger translation so that students have a sense that this is a tiny piece of a much larger work. For many uh, years, the legend of Seyavash was paired with another uh, medieval epic, the Japanese tales of the Heike. And so in the same week, we would discuss different themes about um, heroism in battle, uh, dealing with misfortune and defeat, um, the narrator's voice, uh, sense of uh, fatalism or transcendence. We'd look back to other texts in the course of nobility and civility, such as the Indian epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata, and talk about uh, father-son relationships, uh, the ideas of dharma or doing of, of duty, loyalty, conflicting dharmas. So we would tend to locate the legend of Sayavash, not so much in its historical context, which is absolutely essential for a deepening knowledge of the work, but in the context of the other readings that were assigned in the course, which is important for that first introduction in the type of survey course that uh, nobility and civility is. So is, I would 
have questions that I would send to students the week in advance so they would have an idea of maybe what to look for. And then in the course of the discussion, we go over various topics. Next, next fall, in the syllabus that I have sent, uh, I, that I sent out, next fall we'll be pairing the legend of Seyabash with a West African epic of the hero Sundiata or Sonjata, who also has vicissitudes to do with his uh, brothers and family and family feuds linked to uh, political battles and and war. So this this will be a new a new thing to pair uh, the legend of Seyavash with a completely different epic. But some of the things that we do talk about are first of all genre. I ask the students to situate the work in what how they would consider it in terms of genre and i know it can be linked to um, epic or or tragedy since uh, it has a tragic ending and i asked them to discuss that and then i also do let students know that the larger work moves from myth through epic and into history i ask them to look at the world that's described the geography in advance so that when they come across Chinese brocade or Arabian horses or India or Egypt or or Yemen they have a set or room so the kind of the western part they have a sense or they're they have their eye out for references to what is the larger world uh, of the of the author and then I asked them well where is Turan? And I want to make sure that they're not linking it kind of westward to Turkey, but northeast to uh, Turkestan. And they're thinking about the kind of Western Asia. There is a, a map from a contemporary artist that I asked them to, to look at. And I also asked them, where is the Battle of Balkh, the one that Seyavash uh, is victorious in? And they realized that that is in Afghanistan so that the greater Iran talked about in the work is, does not match the, kind of the political uh, nation of today, but was a larger territory so that they don't make a, um, um, an easy equation, but think that this is something that goes back in, in history. So once we have the, the world situated, I asked them, what about, uh, the uh, feud or the hostilities between Iran and Tehran, and where do they? Where does this come from? Can you tell the differences? What distinguishes the two societies? And so they would not have read the earlier stories, even though they're referred to. So I do mention that the hostilities go back to Feridun and his sons Tur and Iraj, so that they can see this was a a family feud that turned into something that continued on in time and that there aren't noticeable differences between uh, the two uh, territories or the, the two countries at, at war. And so to get them to see that, I ask, what do they do in their free time when they're not fighting each other? How do they spend their time? And so then they'll tell me, well, they're hunting, they're feasting, they're enjoying luxuries or, or gems. They, they do have common activities, sports, and common uh, values. And where they are also um, linked is showing the higher echelons of society. So we're not looking at what the farmers are doing or the artisans, we're looking at a very um, elite aristocratic society on both on both sides. So after talking about the society, then we look at family. So I ask them to talk about Seyavash's father. And in the discussion, it comes out that he really has four father figures. So if he has um, Kavus and Rostam on one side, he has 
uh, Afrasiab and Kiran on the other. So we discuss this mirroring of fathers and father figures. And also then since two fathers or father figures are in, or kings are in authority, we talk about power. What kind, is there any um, message or any idea of statecraft that comes out of the work through the narrative? What kind of kings are Kavus and Afrasiab? And when the students talk about their faults, I ask them, well, are they evil? And they say, well, no, the kings maybe are, are reckless and they have, uh, kind of, um, let's say, mis misguided uh, intentions. But then the real evil characters, the ones who instigate the trouble, are Surabe uh, in Iran and Gorsevaz in Tehran. So we talk about those characters as well. And I ask, could the um, exile of Sevash and his death, could it have been avoided, even though we have characters like Surabe and like Garsavaz? So the students would then maybe talk about the kings being gullible. And I eventually ask, well, could Sayavash had, had done something to avoid his, his fate. So we get into a, a conversation about Sayavash as a hero, what kind of hero he is. Does he have any flaws? Um, and so students tend to um, discuss either he's a perfectly innocent martyr or, well, he does have a flaw, which is to be so gullible that he believes Garcevaz. And Garcevaz even tells him that he's gullible. So then we ask, well, how do you distinguish appearances from the truth? How easy is it for a character or for anyone to go beyond the veil of appearances? And that leads to a discussion of fate because it's not simply human action but the narrator says over and over again that this was fated and so we discuss why is it that when Sayavash is um, accused unjustly by Surabe he is able to go through the trial of fire and emerge unscathed because he's innocent and there's a belief that justice will prevail and then in the same narrative when he is unjustly accused by Garcevas, justice does not prevail. So what happens there? How are we as readers supposed to handle injustice? And what does Sayavash say about it? What does the narrator say about it? There's some fatalistic statements about accepting one's fate because it was an inauspicious uh, uh, alignment of the stars. And is that the message? Should one accept one's fate? Is it easier to accept injustice when we believe that it was fated to happen? Or is it easier or harder if we believe that it is simply out of someone else's malice? And when we're talking about justice, then we can see an injustice in the death of Sayavash but I ask them, do you feel there's justice in the aftermath when Rostam kills Surabe and when Sayavash's son goes on to kill Garsavas and Afrasiab? Is that justice? And I link it back to the book of Job, which is something that they would have read in uh, the literature humanities course from the core curriculum, in which all these terrible things happen to, to Job and he's told there is no justice. And yet at the very end of the story, he's re, his wealth is restored, he, even though his children have died, he's given new children. Is that or is that not justice for Job? And do you feel there's justice in the end in this narrative, even though Surabe, uh, no, I'm sorry, even though Sayavash, Sayavash uh, is a victim of both the injustice of Surabe and the injustice of Garcevas and Afrasiab. 
since I've talked so far about the men, um, I want to always with students make sure we talk about the female characters. So he has the stepmother, Sudebe, that we would have talked about. Um, his own mother is a fascinating character to me since she's mentioned only at the beginning. And in the first reading, I really forgot about her origin because I didn't know anyone's name. But at a second reading, when I went back and saw that she was the daughter, she was the granddaughter of Garcevaz, that stuck with me because by Garcevaz um, maligning and scheming against Sayavash, he was actually responsible for the death of his great grandson. And so the, I, I wondered, because the narrator never brings that irony home, he never says, ah, Garcevas, because of his actions, killed his great, great grandson. And I wondered if that was a detail we were supposed to forget, or as readers, we were supposed to think about. And then when I eventually did read more of the Shaname and saw that the episode prior to the Seyavash episode has Rostam killing his own son without knowing it's his son, I thought maybe there is a message there that when you uh, engage in violence against a stranger, you never know if that stranger is your son in Rostam's case, but even in a um, kind of a more removed sense, uh, a great grandson or a more distant relative or in any case someone who is related to you uh, so Sayavash's mother uh, even though she's only mentioned in the beginning I'd like to bring her up to talk about the part she plays um, as a reminder of Sayavash's double heritage from both Iran and, and Tehran and then the third woman that I'd like to point out as absolutely indispensable would be Sayavash's uh, wife who has a speech and remonstrates with her father, the king, Afrasiab, telling him and begging him not to act on um, the advice of Garcevas. She has the presence, so she's a secondary character, and yet she has the presence to speak up and remonstrate with both her father and the king. And that's something that not even Sayavash does with his own father when he um, has won the battle of Balkh and has made the peace treaty, when his father um, an annuls it and wants him back, Sayavash doesn't have a speech remonstrating with his father. And so we have a female character in the end. So even though it it, it, she doesn't have any luck. It doesn't stop Sayavash from being killed. It is an example of a, a voice speaking up or speaking truth to, to, to power. So once we've talked about the, the women, I also like to bring in the crossing of borders because there are various reasons for crossing borders. So Sayavash's mother crosses the border to escape uh, being beaten or killed by her father, and that leads to a new life being born. Sayavash crosses a border both for war and then in exile. So we talk about his decision. What is his dilemma when he uh, decides to go in, um, into exile rather than obey his father? What is the higher uh, value, what is higher on his value scale? And since the students would have read the Ramayana, there's the example of Rama who goes into exile in order to obey his father, in order to follow his father's command. And so we compare a bit Sayavash who finds there's a higher calling or a higher message, his own conscience or, or God, uh, righteousness uh, in, that leads him to disobey his father. So there's a crossing of a border there in which he finds, a, temporarily at least, a new family. There's the crossing of borders um, for war later on when uh, Sevash's son uh, 
will avenge his, his death. And so in some cases, the crossing of borders leads to life, a new family, friendship. In other cases, it leads to, to war, to, to death. Um, in the end, I asked the students, is there a view of human nature that emerges? Is there is this uh, good and evil? Is there mixed um, emotions? Is it emotion versus reason? What uh, kind of uh, humanity uh, emerges as a picture? And is there any message that they come away with? What is the what is the takeaway? Also, uh, in comparison with other epics that they would have uh, read either on their own or in the Literature Humanities course. The Lit Hum course begins with the Iliad. So everyone in the class would know the, the Iliad and the Odyssey, and they can compare this as well. They would have read Greek tragedies. So we can uh, also, if the students want, discuss the legend of Sayavash, uh, comparing it to the Greek, the Greek tragedies. So the discussion goes back and forth between looking at the text on its own terms and comparing the text to some of the other readings that we've done in the course of the semester or sometimes that students have read on their own and would like to bring in because they see relevant points. I put together a website called World Epics, and there's a page dedicated to the Shaname with an introduction by Olga Davidson and four sections for resources, a bibliography, images, websites, and performances. So on the resource tab dedicated to images, the early images are all about Sevash. One of them is Sayavash playing polo in front of Afrasiab. It's a, a manuscript illustration that is now at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And I asked the students to look at the image and to see if they can um, distinguish the uh, Iranians from the Turanians uh, by dress, by uh, features. And it turns out that maybe the Iranians have a um, kind of a higher, uh, something coming out of their hat. Uh, but otherwise, there are more similarities than differences, and they're all in a circle. And yet, Sayavash is distinguished by a, by a black horse. And there's uh, a way to talk about, is this, a, this is a game, it's a competition, it's a sport, but it's also a um, preparation for war because of its competitive spirit. And another image that I bring up that is on the website is the, um, it's an Indian uh, manuscript illustration from the 1400s in which Sayavash is pulled out of his bed in one scene and in the very next scene he's beheaded. And since the students have just read the narrative and translation, in which Sevash is not pulled out of his bed, but he dies on the battlefield, uh, it gives us an opportunity to talk about the many, many manuscripts, uh, all with variations, and why these manuscripts are so richly illustrated, that they would have been in the possession of kings and the aristocracy, so that this would be an object uh, that's both prestige and uh, giving authority to the owner, to the patron, so that the students have a sense of the variety or the variation in some episodes of the story and also of the um, immense manuscript tradition that the, the, story, that the story has. So I've talked very quickly to try to get in many themes because I'm very uh, eager to hear your insights, uh, your suggestions about other things that could be discussed in the, in the course and that students, uh, American students reading the Legend of Sayavash for the first time 
should be sure to notice and to think about. So thank you for your, for your patience.